we have um, another case for you. She is a 32-year-old woman, um, history of asthma and diabetes, has been trying to get pregnant over the past five years, but has unfortunately had three miscarriages before 10 weeks. She just moved to your city, established care with you as a new PCP. And she said that prior to moving here, her old doctor had sent some lab tests and a lupus anticoagulant test had come back positive. She hasn't had any additional testing, and she's wondering what this lab results means. This is a frequent consult, maybe not with the three miscarriages, but the one or the two, right? And I'm pretty um, compulsive about making sure that we really believe that the antiphospholipid antibodies that uh, have been tested are, are, are truly the appropriate tests um, and that, that they're done in the right fashion and that they're done more than once, right? So... Um, if you're suspecting antiphospholipid, and, and there's actually two, this patient in, might have what we call obstetric antiphospholipid syndrome, right? As opposed to somebody who has had like a PE or a DVT. So, so what are you going to do if you suspect anti uh, antiphospholipid syndrome? First of all, how do you suspect it? Well, I particularly look for people who have unexplained thrombotic events that are somewhat severe um, or unexplained, you know, venous thrombosis or cerebral, uh, like arterial thrombotic events, strokes, uh, bilateral renal infarcts. I just saw a woman like this actually last week. She has bilateral renal infarcts. She's 48. We have no idea why. Her antiphospholipid antibody testing was negative. But, you know, though that's the type of thing you would think of. And so um, there has been a lot of investigation into what antiphospholipid antibody tests really are uh, specific and sensitive for the diagnosis, right? So there are a lot of tests out there that you could order that have no specificity and are not correlated with risk of thrombosis. Uh, so what we look for are the anticardiolipin IgG and IgM uh, and the beta-2 glycoprotein 1 IgG and IgM. And those are considered, you know, the anticardiolipin is considered one test, the beta-2 glycoprotein 1 is another. IgG has more specificity for or be, has a higher association with ha provoking thrombosis and having thrombosis than IgM. And part of the reason may be, as you know, the IgM is the pentamer and it's kind of easier to have nonspecific sticking and get some false positives, right? So, so those are ELISA-based tests. And we'll talk about those tests first because you have to have a titer that's high enough that that you're concerned about it. And so the, the titer that people get concerned about is a titer of 40, uh, you know, units or higher. Um, I, you know, if the threshold is, you know, less than 15 or less than 20, somebody with an acute illness is going to have a positive test, Right. Kids who have strep throat all have like positive anticardiolipin antibodies, right? So, you know, you really have to be careful when you're testing somebody, what else is going on at the time they're, that they're being tested. Uh, and acute inflammatory disorders can give you positive uh, antibody tests like that. But also um, up to 5%, and some people would even say 9% of like healthy blood donors. So healthy blood donors have been tested and a number of different people have looked at the prevalence of antiphospholipid antibodies in this population. And it's high, it's like 5%. And they're sitting there not doing anything. Thing. And so one of the problems is, is that no one has been able to find an assay that will tell you which antiphospholipid antibodies um, precipitate thrombosis and which are just kind of innocent bystanders floating around in the blood like an anti-staph or an anti-strep antibody, right? So, so that's what makes it hard. In, and that's why not only do they have to be positive around the time that the event occurred, but then they also have to be persistently positive, at least, uh, you know, a 12 week or longer interval between testing. There are clot based assays um, and, and that's those are also um, much more finicky to do <laughs> than uh, than the ELISA based assays. Right. So you could have your patient sitting in the ED uh, and they just had a stroke and they're like, you know, a 43 year old woman. And you're like, well, is this, you know, cryptogenic idiopathic or is it antiphospholipid syndrome? 
you can send the ELISA assays and, and be pretty confident that you're going to get accurate results. You cannot send a clot-based assay because these are affected by anticoagulants. Mm. Um, even though we try to do some manipulations, um, like you can take the patient's plasma and you can add heparinase and destroy any heparin in there, but you're still not 100% confident that you get result, good results. So antiphospholipid syndrome um, still carries the name of lupus anticoagulant syndrome. Right, and these antiphospholipid antibodies were identified first in patients who have lupus, and people were looking for something in these patients with lupus who were getting clots. But when they looked at their blood in the test tube, their PTT was prolonged, right? And like, what was that all about, right? Well, in order to have the PTT run and even the PT, you need phospholipids in there because now I get to be technical and all coaggy. Um, <laughs> the coag factors have to be in the right orientation in order for the enzyme to fit in the pocket and cleave them and activate them. And, and basically the coag cascade is a series of enzymatic activation reactions that ultimately lead in a clot. So you need phospholipid in there. And if you have antibody, antiphospholipid antibody in the test tube, it slows down the reaction between the clotting factors and the phospholipid and the binding and the orientation, and you get some steric interference. And you can also get that with beta-2 glycoprotein 1. It, it interferes with the, the, the ability of the factors to, to be activated and clot in the test tube. In vitro, they activate thrombosis. I'm sorry, in vivo. In people, they activate thrombosis. But in the test tube, they slow it down. So what you do to for these clot-based assays, and there's the dilute Russell Viper venom test. There's the kaolin uh, activation assay. There's the PTTLA, which is PTT lupus anticoagulant. That the PTTLA um, is probably the most commonly used. It, the machine that it's used on the Stago machine and reagents are pretty prevalent. And what that test does is actually dilute the phospholipid that so that the concentration of phospholipid is lower than in your standard PTT assay because now it makes the test much more sensitive to be able to detect the presence of, of an antiphospholipid antibody. And so if that PTTLA test um, or DRVVT, and I'll explain why the DRVVT, but the concept's the same. Um, if that test um, takes longer than normal to clot in the test tube, you then go on and do a confirmatory test. And the idea behind the confirmatory test is you're confirming that it's a lupus anticoagulant. So what do you do? You take the patient's plasma and you add um, a lot of excess phospholipid. And this is either smushed up platelets, the platelet neutralization procedure, or it's uh, hexagonal phase phospholipids. And you put it in the patient's plasma and all their antiphospholipid antibodies bind to these exogenous, antiphos the anti exogenous phospholipids. And then you pull that out and now you have the patient's treated plasma, and then you run that same PTTLA assay again. And now if you've removed the antiphospholipid antibody with this procedure, then the, the time it takes to clot in the test tube should be shorter and should be normal. And that's when you've confirmed that the test is positive. I spend, you know, at least... I don't know, 20 minutes every week explaining to somebody who sent these tests what those assays mean. Right? Um, <laughs> I had to look it up. Uh, and I, yeah, I was looking up diagrams to prepare for this to try to figure it out. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so, so I'm happy to discuss it, right? And dilute Russell Viper venom was actually, is a snake venom, right? Yeah. That, that activates further down in the coagulation cascade. So if you're somebody like that has... Um, if you if you have hemophilia, right, and you have a factor eight deficiency, well, it doesn't matter because DRVVT, uh, uh, the Lute Russell Viper venom activates ten down at the bottom, and then it it makes pro, you know prothrombin go to thrombin, and that's where some of the antiphospholipid antibodies seem to hang things up, um, and the prothrombin to thrombin to to cleavage part. So anyway, so those are the tests that we do. And so there are clot-based assays, there's the anti-cardiolipin, and there's the beta-2 glycoprotein 1. And those are the three groups. 
And so when you hear us talk about triple positive, you have a positive in any of those three. And the ELISA-based assays ha- have to be high titer and they have to be persistently positive. And if three of them aren't positive, um, say two of them are or one of them, say the PTTLA is positive and the beta-2, those same tests have to be positive 12 weeks later, okay? Mm -hmm. Because otherwise you're just getting some random, you know, everybody, lots of people with COVID had antifossil lipid antibodies present, right? But that doesn't mean that they're persistent and doesn't mean that they're the cause of the clot. Do you care more about one of them than the others or kind of in terms of the ranking of them, how you think about that? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. And and, and someone, someone just published a paper about whether beta-2 glycoprotein 1 really means anything in this situation. Um, I will say that people have investigated like antiphosphatidyl serine, right, uh, and, and IgA uh, uh, subtype, immunoglobulin subtypes, and those are not validated and correlated with the development of thrombosis in patients. And people are pretty rigorous about this. So I I will say that one of my best strategies for truly identifying uh, antifossil lipid syndrome is to look at the patient's baseline PTT before any anticoagulation. And if that's elevated, then you're pretty confident that it's a strong antiphospholipid antibody, right? Because remember, it doesn't have the dilute phospholipid that the PTTLA has. So it's got a high concentration of phospholipid. So if that's prolonged and they have a pro- positive clot-based assay, um, then I'm pretty confident in that. Um, in our institution, the DRVBT is actually a terrible test and everybody has a positive and half of us <laughs> discounted if it's the only <laughs> test that's positive, right? So so you kind of have to know your own own lab. Um, but, but, you know, I see, so I, I, I see a lot of patients from our rheumatology service, right? And, and like, when do these ever become criteria for diagnosis, diagnosing lupus, right? Or RA, but they send them all in their patients who've never had a clot. And then you find these really high titers, like really, really high, like 800, 1,000, 1,500 units, you know, for ACL or beta 2. And you're like, oh, my God, well, and they're like, well, should we anticoagulate them? The answer is no, um, because they haven't had a clot. Um, And we know in patients who have lupus that they do have an increased risk of developing a thrombotic event, but it's, it's around in very poorly done studies, 9 to 10%. Okay, and poorly done, meaning they don't have a lot of patients, they don't have rigorous, you know, uh, documentation of the levels. Um, so, so that's, um, you know, something that I, I, we treat those, pa- I, I give them aspirin, there's some anecdotal a- data that aspirin might work for those patients with collagen vascular disorders and high titers, but not every patient will take it. Um, and it's usually the patients who have some thrombocytopenia due to an antiphospholipid antibody that we also um, consider aspirin. So getting back to our patient here, right? So she's somebody that I would want to know when the antiphospholipid antibody panel was done in um, relation to timing of the um, uh, miscarriages, uh, although three sequential ones, um, uh, you know, is, is a bit telling, and that meets the Sapporo criteria or the the Sydney criteria, which are the revised Sapporo criteria. Um, the other thing I want to, and, and I just throw this out here for general medical knowledge, is the the other thing too is actually looking um, for chromosomal abnormalities um, and and making sure that they've had some other diagnostic workup. Um, for like chromo- chromosomal abnormalities in, in the embryo, chromosomal abnormalities in the parents. I, I saw one couple um, and uh, for antiphospholipid syndrome, right? And that's actually how they got to the rheumatologist who then sent the patient to me. Uh, and they were from, they were related from a vi- village in a Middle Eastern country. Uh, and they both carried a gene defect that that was, you know, homozygous lethal. 
Um, so it took a while to identify that. So, so again, you want to, you know, in this situation, you want to, um, do all the due diligence about reasons for having miscarriages. And then if you think it's anti-fossil, obstetric anti-fossil lipid syndrome, um, then, then you treat accordingly. Um, you know, the second and third trimester, uh, pregnancy losses are, are very sad. Um, and usually not only do you have, uh, persistently positive tests, but you also have, um, like placental pathology, which is pretty telling. 